Hi, folks. This is Abel James, and thanks so much for listening to the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. I'm coming to you on one of those exceedingly rare rainy days here in Austin, Texas. Actually, I was supposed to see Adams for Peace at Austin City Limits this weekend, and it was totally rained out, which was a bummer, but then I got to see some of the most epic back-to-back comebacks in Boston sports history. So all is, all is well here in Austin. Uh, lots of excitement going on. Uh, one, one quick thing, um, I can't believe it, but we haven't really focused on the Facebook page all that much yet. Um, and so we're, we're just coming up on 10,000 fans, which is awesome. It's a huge milestone. But to put it into perspective, my buddy George Bryant over at Civilized Caveman, when he was over here around Easter at the house, in 24 hours, we figured out a way uh, to get him 10,000 fans overnight. And it was totally free. <laughs> I won't give the secrets away, but it had something to do with giving away bacon. So I'll actually be giving away loads of bacon, 20, maybe even 40 pounds of it in just a few weeks when we relaunch Fat Burning Chef. So I wanted to tell you about that uh, as well. Um, Fat Burning Chef, for those of you who have already uh, purchased it, I'll be sending the new version, the new expanded version with new recipes uh, reformatted to you completely for free uh, as, a, as a special thanks for buying the previous version and helping support us there. Uh, but basically what it is is a collaborative cookbook where we take some of the best cooks in paleo and gluten-free and beyond and put all of their favorite recipes uh, in, in one spot so that you guys uh, can have it and take it home. And what we're doing, so we've been making apps as well, which is cool. So it's, it's not going to be an app quite yet, but that might be coming down the road. But basically, we're going to have lots of functionality in the digital ebook so that you can use it like an app. Uh, so really quickly get to recipes uh, and, and that sort of thing. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, as we come up to 10,000 fans, if you haven't clicked like on Fat Burning Man on Facebook yet, Please take a second to do that. We're going to be giving away uh, one of these shirts, which is a lot of people have asked about this, but it's um, 83% paleo. The rest is for cigars and scotch. And that pretty much wraps up my, my whole life. It sums it all up right there. <laughs> now, uh, the backstory on this is that um, we've been making silly shirts, which you have probably seen me wear if you've been watching the video on the show for a while. My girlfriend Allison's brother has a, a print shop so he's able to just print up shirts and we're planning on selling them but the logistics of having like a physical products business is a nightmare so we're just going to be for now anyway printing uh, some of these silly shirts up for giveaways and that sort of thing so as we come up to 10,000 Facebook fans all you have to do uh, to enter the giveaway for this t-shirt is and not the one I'm wearing we'll make a new one for you is uh, go over to facebook.com uh, find the Fat Burning Man fan page, click like, or if you've already clicked like, uh, share the status with somebody else so that your friends can find the show uh, and, the, and the Facebook fan page as well, uh, and that'll enter you too. All right, so today's show is pretty cool. It's with Dan Edwards, and he's the founding member of Parkour Generations, and I was actually so inspired by this show, which I interviewed uh, Dan a little bit earlier, so I recorded it a few days ago. I actually last night went out and tried some very beginner level parkour type stuff and uh, we were vaulting over these beams and standing on railings and trying to do squats and that sort of thing and I am way worse than I thought I would be but it uh, it makes you feel like a kid again. It is, it is super cool to move your body in that way and it brings you back down to earth and when you realize that uh, that other people are totally capable of doing these things that seem superhuman and you try doing it yourself, you actually find that you can do a lot more than you ever thought possible. Um, at the beginning of the class, I was just like, oh my gosh, I have to jump over that. And then by the end of the class, I was just kind of vaulting over it, doing speed vaults and enjoying the heck out of the time and not really being, not having that fear uh, anymore. And we des describe that fear and how you can conquer it on the show. Uh, and that, that's a really important thing. I'm really glad that we got to talk about that. On the show, we also talked about why bicep curls are pretty much a waste of your time and how you can build functional strength to upgrade your performance no matter what you do. All right, let's go hang out with Dan. All right, folks, today we're here with Dan Edwards, who's the founding member of Parkour Generations, the world's leading professional organization for the dynamic movement discipline of parkour and free running. Yeah, those crazy dudes running up and down the sides of buildings, that's what Dan does. So how's it going, Dan? Hey, well, not too bad. Yourself? 
I'm doing really well. So I, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with parkour, but just in case they aren't, what in the world is it? And why would anyone jump from one building to another and do somersaults in midair and that sort of thing? Yeah, it does. I guess it does look a bit crazy if, um, from the outside when you, I guess that the, what, what most people normally see is through the media is they normally see the movies and the commercials and that sort of side of things, which yeah. it does look a bit crazy. Um, but, um, but you know, parkour is obviously, uh, that, that's just one side of it. That's the spectacle side mm -hmm. that is, um, the showcase side, I guess. Um, but parkour is much more than that. Um, and where it came from and, and what it's actually about is, um, is a, is a very sort of holistic functional training discipline for, for the complete individual really sort of looking to train the body, the mind, um, the spirit, you know, training everything about yourself to become as good a version as you can be. Yeah. Um, and from that came the ability, uh, for the founding guys from that came the ability to do, you know, stuff that looks superhuman, the jumps and, uh, you know, the amazing movement. So, but that was kind of, um, secondary to the original purpose, which was just to, to test yourself. So, yeah. But yeah, it does look kind of crazy, but but actually, it's um, there's a lot of method behind it, um, and a lot of um, a, a lot of kind of rational thinking and, and and you know good calculations and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So the way that it started was it more fitness or functional movement in terms of like trying to get people into shape? Where where did it start? Well, it started in France. Um, it was born in France in the '80s, so a group of young guys in the suburbs of Paris, um, Lise, Every, Sarcelles, these areas. Um, which are pretty sort of run-down areas of Paris, some of them, um, and a mix of kind of urban and rural areas. Um, at the beginning, it wasn't at all um, really focused on getting people fit or being a health, healthy sort of um, discipline in, in that way, or that wasn't the, the intention. The intention of the founders was just to find out what they could do as, mm -hmm. as humans, to challenge themselves, um, to, to see where their limits were, to see if they could sort of set a task and overcome it. And, and those tasks and challenges were... Some of them were crazy and insane. You know, can can you climb this mountain? Can you run from the center of Paris to you know the next city in France in one day? Can you you know crawl for ten miles? Can you lift these boulders? Can you whatever crazy challenges? Um, and in doing so, they found that their limits were far more than they thought. Um, and they began to to realize that with if as they focused in, it became you know a training discipline. They began to realize that um, the limits of the human body and mind were were way more expansive than they believed. Um, yeah. That's kind of where it came from. So, and it's evolved even beyond that. But um, but yeah, that's where it started. So it started out as you know very rough, very um, very unformed. Uh, and over years of training and, and pushing themselves, it began to form. Yeah, I love that. So with you, what's an example of when you? pushed your limit and did something that you probably didn't think was possible before you did it. Well, I mean, um, when I started, you mean parkour? Yeah. Uh, or or well, in life in general, that's, that's all game too. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, me, me, myself, I mean, I, uh, I, when I was, since I was young, I started in, in functional fighting disciplines and martial arts. So that's kind of, um, cool. what I lived with. And that was, you know, I was very kind of serious about that since I was a kid. Um, and, uh, you know, so I was always pushing myself and challenging myself in that way. Um, and there's plenty of challenges in those disciplines. And I became pretty, um, pretty fairly competent out of my guess. So I sort of got used to them and got used to the, the dealing with the fear in that space, you know. Mm. Um, and then when I came across parkour and I was uh, sort of um, in my early 20s, uh, it was tiny back then. There were very few people training. But when I came across it um, and saw the founders doing what they were doing, uh, it kind of made me realize that, you know, I thought I was functional and capable as an individual um, yeah. and had good balance and was strong and agile and all this stuff and fast, I thought. But then when I saw what they were doing, I realized, you know, I'm, I'm nothing. I realized I was completely um, uh, nowhere near my limits and certainly nowhere near what they were capable of doing. Yeah. So um, so I wanted to try that. So I went out and, and, and tried it. And my first training session really uh involved the jump that you know right from day one that was beyond what i thought was my limit it involved the jump that you know i i shouldn't have i chose to do it. i shouldn't have probably shouldn't have done it and i probably wouldn't recommend people start with that sort of jump now. but um we, certainly we don't when we coach it now we don't get people doing that stuff from day one but there was very little guidance back then and uh the jump it you know made me afraid to i saw that i could do it i could make it it was kind of what we call an arm jump where you jump across a gap and catch another wall with your arms and land yeah. your feet on the wall and then pull yourself up onto it. Obviously, um, we've seen that in movies, I think. 
<laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. Um, and it was only, you know, the drop wasn't huge. It was like, I guess, a 20-foot drop or something. Um, and so if you didn't make it, it's probably going to be bad. You know, you'd probably break a limb or something. And um, But I kind of could see that I could make it distance-wise. And But I felt afraid. I felt really afraid. Sure. And I hadn't felt that fear for years. So that was... That, and that drew me into it. I thought, wow, this is really a visceral fear. It's really, this is, you know, this is not a game. This is not a, um, it's not a, this is a real test of my abilities. Yeah. You know, it's not kind of just training. It's a real world test. Can I do this? You know, you can talk about how far you can jump or how strong you are, how fit you are, and you can lift weights and, and all that, which is great. But can you actually do this real world challenge of getting from here to here? It wasn't designed for this. Um, these walls weren't put there for that. But could you do that? Could you get from that one to that one safely under your own steam with your own skills? You know, that's what went through my head. Um, and I did it. I managed to do it and, and kind of pulled, climbed up and was okay. And as soon as I did that jump, I knew, okay, I'm going to train this forever. As soon as I did that, I knew, right, that is, that I want this test all the time. Um, wow. I, I want to know that I'm doing this. I want to challenge myself in this way, you know, regularly. Um, and what more can I do? Uh, and so from then, it kind of went from there, yeah. Wow. If you, hadn't, so right day one, yeah. if you hadn't taken that jump, do you think you'd still be doing it today? Um, yeah, probably. I mean, uh, I, yes, probably, because I was kind of hooked just from what I'd seen, really. Um, and I, I probably would have taken it slower. That's fine. Um, and like I say when we coach, you know, we, we, we introduce people very progressively. And um, yeah. some people might have that jump straight away. That's fine. But, but um, you know, we, we tend to be a bit more sensible about it now, now that we've <laughs> got that approach. When I started, as I say, there was no guidance and um, we, we were just kind of finding our way and seeing what we could do. And, and back then it kind of required a sort of uh, a very sort of autotelic, self-driven kind of slightly crazy attitude to get into it. Yeah, Cause sure. there was no, it wasn't, just wasn't accessible. Uh, now it's completely different. You know, we have coaching programs, coaching certifications, massive uh, classes, thousands of great coaches and great practitioners around the world. So it's much more accessible um, and much better in that way. But when I started, yeah, it was, you, you had to be slightly crazy to, to get into it. Uh, <laughs> but, but, it but it worked, you know, and I loved it. And, um, and yeah, the chat after that, there was very few things challenged you as much as this I found. Um, yeah. Uh, and I, I like the fact that it was, you know, real, it was task oriented. It was always like, can you do this challenge? Whatever the challenge was, it wasn't yeah. necessarily doing amazing movements or acrobatics. It was sometimes very small movements or, or very technical things, but um, or sometimes purely physical, endurance-based or power-based or strength-based or willpower-based challenges. But um, it was always asking that question, you know, can you do this? Can What, what have you got today? Yeah. Uh, and, and it was relentless and remorseless, uh, merciless in that way. It was just sort of, because it, you know, it doesn't care. The, the, parkour the discipline the, the environment you're training in the walls or whatever they don't care if you can do the jump yeah but they will let you know that you can't do it that day just so, and, and you you know inside oh, okay today i didn't have it sure. and you know it's so it's it's kind of harsh in a way but it but that's good that's the test i think that's i think that's good and i think that's missing a lot in, in modern life now so. oh absolutely or well, even just um having fear a real yeah. fear I, w I would imagine that you know, people come to you and they want to learn how to bounce off of walls and do amazing Spider-Man type things. But what you actually teach is more around facing your fear and addressing that, right? Can you can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you're exactly right. Um, and it's not even that we sort of have to teach that. It's that they, people come and say, "I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to do that." Um, and we say, "Okay, that's great, man. Let's let's start at the start at you know step one. Start at the basics, mm -hmm. um, and and just." you know, look at some basic skills first and straight away they'll feel the fear. As soon as we get them to do the basic skills, they'll be like, uh, oh, hang on. Because it, it kind of looks, when you see it on TV, on YouTube, it looks easy. It's done yeah. so effortlessly. You think, oh, it must be okay to jump from there to there or do this, you know. But then when you actually step up on the wall to do it, even if it's only three or four feet high, to jump to another wall that's maybe four or five feet away, which for an adult male, okay, is going to be quite a small jump. They're going to be able to make it power-wise. But a lot of people will not do it. Yeah. The majority won't do it. They'll step. They'll just be like, uh, and they'll kind of freeze because they haven't done that for so long. It's so unusual for them to move in that way, to use their body in that way naturally. The, they, 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 this kind of fear reactivity thing happens, and they, they sort of, you know, freeze. They can't do it. So we don't even need to talk about the fear. We just get them training, and straight away, day one, same mm -hmm. as it was, the fear finds you. You know. Yeah. Um, and 
and then you find out, you know, okay, um, I'm going to have to find a way through this. I'm going to have to manage this fear. Um, and we will help them. That's what we do as coaches. We help them, you know, we give them tools and methods to overcome the fear and, and to, um, to be able to manage the risk safely and manage their fear and deal with it. Um, but at the end of the day, they have to do it. You know, you can give them as many tools as you can, but at the end of the day, it has to come from inside them. Do they have it? Yeah. Uh, and they have to answer that question. And that's really interesting to see everyone go through that right from day one. And you see people respond to it in different ways. Sure. Um, and it's, uh, it's really cool, but it's, it's, yeah, I think the fear thing is, is maybe the most important part of, of parkour, one of the most one of the most um, useful things about it in this day and age, because I think there are lots of ways to get fit and strong. I mean, you know, you know, you're you're really fit, strong guy. You've got loads of great training methods. There's loads of great training methods around the world for that, um, and they always have been for decades. So I think there's, you know, humanity is pretty much nailed um, getting fit and getting strong. Yeah. We, we do well. There's a lot of stuff out there that does it badly, but um, um, if if you're serious about it, as you found, as yeah. you're serious about it, you can find the information. You can do it. Yeah. But there aren't many things in, in our modern lifestyle that um, expose you to real fear and real risks that you can manage um, in a beneficial way. Uh, that, you know, the most risk and fear is taken out of things yeah. uh, purposely mm-hmm. because of this idea that everything has to be you know, safe and whatever. Um, but in doing so, you, you take away all the benefits that come from managing risk and facing fear. So, Parkour is one of the few things that actually just basically says, well, forget that, you know, we're going to make you face your fear right from day one and you're going to learn to deal with these risks. Um, and we're going to ask you to deal with these risks. Uh, we're going to help you along the way, but basically we're going to ask you to step up and deal with it. Yeah. Um, and, but and people love it. You know, that people love that. They go, yes, this is, this is, uh, this is what's missing from my life. And they, yeah. that's why they, that's why it's kind of one of the fastest growing free sports in the world, or potentially the fastest growing we hit. So yeah. yeah, there's really no bigger rush than that. Facing your fear, pushing through it, and then finding yourself on the other end. Those are the most you know salient memories that most people have over the course of their lives or doing something like that. You mentioned that the uh, the martial arts that you did growing up that was that was a fear, but it was kind of a different kind. Yeah, can you expand yeah, on that? Different. What's what's the difference between those two? Um. Well, it depends how you train. Now, if you train in a, if you're training very combative fighting arts, and you put yourselves in in you know as realistic situations as you can, I suppose, without actually you know going out and looking for a fight or whatever, yeah. uh, which obviously is not recommended. Um, <laughs> then it's you, a great you, workout, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you survive it, it's a good workout. Um, then um, you, you know you can obviously you still find that fear, and if you if you fight in a in Thailand in a Muay Thai ring or shoot fighting or you know MMA stuff, you will feel that fear. Um, and you have to deal with it, and that's mm-hmm. good. That's great, and that that's kind of very similar. But in that's even that's pretty rare in the martial arts now. I guess about ninety, you know, maybe ninety ninety five percent of uh, what's called martial art training is doesn't have that element to it. The closest it'll get is some form of spar- sparring or competitive training with with pads and things. So yeah. yeah, the fear is really there's really the fear is really taken out of that because the risk is pretty much taken out of it. Um, so. So it's different. There's a there's but there's a, there's a there's a thing in Germany, for example, called um called the Mensur, which is um which is a, a fencing uh, challenge. That all the fences, the fencing houses, the core over there, um, they can. It's a very traditional thing. They can still challenge each other and fight this thing called the Mensur, um, which is very rare, um, but they still do it. Um, and you you basically get one fight from this house faces another fight from this house. Uh, they they face off in um. In a, in a room, their their feet they surround they they um they stand in a small circle each, and they're not allowed to leave that circle. So they basically can't move their feet effectively. Yeah. Wow. Um, and they wear metal neck guards, metal eye goggles, and metal guards on the wrists. And they have real swords. Um, and they fight until either you submit or the doctor says one of you can't continue. Really, right? That's it's pretty just serious. a flesh wound. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. Exactly. Um, now that's pretty serious, right? Now they um the there's a guy that wrote a book about that, great book. Um, and um and he says that uh, he was a swordsman and a fencer and all that, but he said it wasn't until he did the mensur that he really understood fear, hmm. um, because you know when you're standing face when someone's standing across from you with a sword trying actually to cut you, um, 
then you then that's very visceral, very immediate fear. And after he did that, I think he did it seven times, I think the men saw him total. After he did those, um, he said pretty much nothing else in the world scared him. He said yeah. he wasn't afraid of anything after that. You know, going job interviews, um, right. you know, traffic wardens, speeding tickets, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, there's no fear in that sort of stuff compared to, okay, this guy's trying to kill me with a sword. <laughs> with a uh, sword. And, uh, <laughs> and that is, um, that, that sounds pretty extreme, but in, in I think parkour is kind of similar to that, oddly. Right. In the, when you're doing parkour, you know, there's no guy trying to kill you with a sword, fortunately. But um, maybe you could combine the two in some way. But no, the, um, <laughs> um, in parkour, you know, you're kind of, it's the same feeling. And you sort of, when you're, when you're doing the movements, you realize that, it's just me keeping me safe here. There's no pads, there's no mats, there's no you know elbow mitts or helmets. It's just me and my skill and my ability, my strengths. Um, and if they're not good enough, or if I make a mistake, then you know maybe I'm going to get hurt. Maybe it's only going to be a bang or a bruise or a cut. Yeah. You know, like I saw things, which is okay. Um, but you know, it could be worse. Um, and that that's the same kind of fear. You know, um, I think it's that that's what that fear between the two is the same. But only if you're in the martial arts, only if you're training in. You don't necessarily have to be doing a mental, but, you know, only if you're actually really um, taking some kind of risk, I guess. I guess it's linked to risk. Right. And I think so many people, I'm so glad that we're talking about this. We haven't talked about this since I think my show with uh, Mark Devine on Unbeatable Mind. And it's all about facing fears and and pushing through them. But yeah. I, I love how you talked about fear being kind of relative. Once you fought someone with a sword and had real things at stake, then like going into a job interview is a joke. Like yeah. the, how, yeah. how are you going to, <laughs> your teeth are not going to be chattering when that happens. Yeah. But I think what we find in today's very accommodating, squishy, comfy society is that everyone's just kind of like doodling along and these our, our barometer of what risk is and what fear is, is completely off. And everything is, you know, people are, road rage is a perfect example of that. Like people are bananas just driving around losing their minds, um, something that could be, you know, very low stress if they wanted it to be. Um, yeah. Things like job interviews or, uh, you know, there's that Seinfeld uh, quip that basically says you're better off <laughs> in the coffin than doing the eulogy because the fear of public speaking is so large. <laughs> it's yeah, that the yeah. fear of public speaking is higher than the fear of death. Yes. <laughs> so it's better to be in the coffin. It's, it's just ridiculous. But doing things like parkour, they, they take that barometer and they shake it up a little bit. They show you something that you can really be afraid of, you know, jumping yeah. from building to building or even doing like a small jump at the beginning. There's yeah, this, this the there's this visceral feeling that you don't really get from these other things. Um, so I would imagine that people who, who become accomplished in parkour actually become a lot more accomplished in life. Is, is that a pattern that you see? That people are all of a sudden to go, they go into a job interview and they crush it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean absolutely. It, it, it kind of, um, you know, you can, it translates to many other walks of life. The sort of stuff you learn in in a discipline like parkour, which is kind of a transformative practice in a way. You know, any, anything you you take from that, if you really get into it, that will that will overlap into many other walks of life that you go into. So, and parkour definitely does kind of recalibrate your understanding of fear and your body's fear response mechanisms because i mean the the you know it's basically comes down to the startle reflex right the, the startle reflex which was designed to keep you safe mm -hmm. by doing by bringing various physiological changes about in in high risk situations such as being attacked by a tiger or something sure. um, that startle reflex still is in your body but now it fires for a completely the wrong time so for example you're about to do public speaking and you start your hands start to get sweating and you your heartbeat increases and you know your 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 vision starts to narrow uh all those processes are, are fight or flight processes um and there's no reason for your body to be doing them then because mm -hmm. there's a threat other than you get booed off stage right there's no real yeah. danger to your body so um the the fight or flight reflex is is, is being calibrated or it's not calibrated anymore we don't the body doesn't know when it's meant to use it because mm -hmm. it never faces any real fear so doing things like parkour does recalibrate that and it makes you realize okay those responses are for this level of fear yeah and down here job interviews public speaking oh, i don't care i don't need that response because there's nothing that's going to happen to me the worst is going to happen is i'm not going to get a job or get booed off stage right yeah. um so there's no physical like so there's no visceral um uh risk yeah so 
And yeah, we see that all the time in parkour, not only with um, with the adults, but with kids, especially sure. um, the problem solving and the oh, t- dealing with risks um, that they do in the parkour. They then go into their academic subjects mm-hmm. and do a lot better. They're a lot bolder mentally. They're a lot more willing to take leaps, you know, no pun intended, but they're a lot more, <laughs> a lot more willing to kind of, um, you know, uh, use their imagination to think outside the box, uh, lateral thinking, try that and use the problem solving kind of um, ability they've gained in parkour, which is very much about physical problem solving. Mm-hmm. They, they take that and they apply it to other subjects. So they actually become better academically. We've got a lot of reports uh, from the really? schools that we've yeah, on that front. It's really cool. Um, wow. It's the same same for adults. They just become much more confident. Uh, and we see it in all the guys and, and, and the girls in the academy. They just become a lot more confident, a lot more, you know, physically they become more confident. Mm-hmm. And then that has a crossover into your mind. Mm-hmm. And then mentally and as a person they become more confident too so um i think both are obviously strongly linked so and that's really awesome to see yeah yeah so what's it like teaching children versus adults i certainly <laughs> have my own opinions about this but i, I would love to hear yours i uh, see so you coach kids here yeah so actually i used to uh teach guitar i'm a musician and uh that's one of the ways that i paid my way through college was was teaching children as well as adults how to play music. And it was fascinating psychologically, what mostly what the adults do to their own brains and the hangups they give themselves. But I don't want to ask too much of a leading question. What have you uh, found? Yes. Well, you, I mean, you've probably experienced what we've experienced, which is, um, that, uh, yeah, um, adults typically will, it's the whole empty your cup thing. Adults typically will have to unlearn a lot of yeah. uh, mental processes and hangups and, um, and patterns that are not necessarily healthy or beneficial to their movement, mm-hmm. um, and to their fear. Adults often are hugely fear reactive because they have, because they've, you know, fallen over more times or gotten sure. injured or become less physically capable because they've stopped moving, um, they are much more afraid of movement and of things like that, just because they haven't done it for as long, uh, for so long, you know, as kids do it every day. Um, adults have forgotten how to do that. Yeah. Um, and they've often developed very weird motor patterns and stuff over, over um, very sedentary, inactive lives. So it's much harder for them to do very, very simple things. Whereas when you teach kids, um, they will, on the whole, uh, they will naturally do a lot of the move. You don't even have to teach them a lot of the movements mm-hmm. in parkour. You just give them the challenge, mm-hmm. set them the parameters of the challenge, you know, um, like how you want it done or how quickly you want it done or how well you want it done or whatever. It'll get from here to there and then let them do it. And they will do it. They will find a way to do it because they're not fear reactive, most of them. Yeah. So, um, but then obviously, so they've got that benefit, but then you've got the, the you know, the, the harder side of working with children, which can be, you know, keeping them focused uh, keeping, um, you know, keeping good discipline in the session, um, stopping them beating each other up, uh, you know, <laughs> things like that. Just, just those sort of practical coaching issues. But, um, in terms of movement and fear, yeah, uh, normally they have a lot, um, they have a lot fewer blocks. They have yeah. far fewer blocks than, than the adults have. Yeah. Is there a pattern in, uh, I guess this, this movement that is not effective that, that you see in a lot of adults, maybe desk jockeys, is there a way that we're all kind of moving that's just wrong? There's, well, there's many ways, and it's mainly the lack of movement yeah. that is wrong. You know, obviously, um, you know, someone wisely said that we're we're Cro-Magnon bodies living in a digital age. Yeah, um, and and that's exactly right. You know, we're designed to walk, hunt, run, fight, um, carry stuff, climb. We're, we're designed to do that from when we get up to when we go to bed. Basically, that's sure. what the body is designed to do. Um, and now we spend the whole time. So, or the majority of the time sitting down, you know, um, probably 70, 80% of your waking day, if you're an average sort of desk jockey, is sitting down either in a car or on the tube or at work or watching TV when you get home. So, and then maybe if you're, you know, if you're lucky, you do like an hour of gym time or something. But that hour of gym time is not enough to offset the other 11 waking hours of sitting down. Mm-hmm. So that's the main problem, that pattern, because that, that so debilitates the body and so weakens all the muscle groups that are necessary for movement and changes the posture of the skeleton and all that stuff, as I'm sure you know. Um, and then you've got to, if someone wants to get back into movement, they have to radically overhaul their lifestyle from that. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the truth, you know, it's not the, um, unfortunately, that it's not the quick fix of, you know, eight minute abs or, or um, yeah. you just... Do this ten three times. Do ten minutes work three three times a week, and you'll be fit and healthy. It's like no, no, that's not the way. It's not going to work like that. Your body has you have to find a lifestyle 
that means you are you have enough time every day to be active to be uh rolling around you know to be mobilizing your body to be using your muscles um you and you've got to find that enough time every day so that your week has enough of that in it to balance out all the sitting down you're doing yeah uh, and that that's just the harsh truth is that mm-hmm. it does require a big overhaul for many people so when they come to parkour you know we we teach them parkour obviously um and we don't go on about this stuff too much we, we're not there to lecture them or anything but we like to try to encourage people to you know think in that way to train train often not to say train hard but train often um and try to make every aspect of what you do your training um yeah. whether you're walking you know start walking to work rather than taking the tube start cycling rather than taking the car um and when you walk to work alter your roots every now and again you know mm-hmm. or or climb over a railing on the way or something like that you know do but but and and kind of parkour encourages that automatically because it just changes people's vision of their surroundings. Mm-hmm. So they'll start doing that as soon as they've done parkour classes. They'll start seeing the world differently anyway and start thinking, oh, I can jump over this or I can climb up that. <laughs> so they start doing it kind of anyway, um, uh, and they just have an expanded view of their environment. So I think that's that's kind of a key thing though yeah, is trying to encourage people to lead a more holistic lifestyle and and to give enough priority and time to that side of them which which has been definitely pushed pushed down the whole kind of physical 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 lifestyle you know physicality yeah. is kind of being oh it's not so important we just do that as an afterthought we do that by going to the gym here and there right but actually the real important thing is desk work and you know yeah. sort of, and- <laughs> so is there I, I feel like a lot of the exercises that that are pushed out there by men's health magazines and um other magazines and traditional media are, are like bicep curls or you know like ab rolling and sit-ups and stuff like that is there a one exercise or a small set of exercises that actually are very very functional in in your field that get people started in in parkour yeah um i mean the the, the area of exercise that we look at first is um it's just movement you know mm-hmm. it's not um now bicep curls and things like that or whatever you know um it's better than doing nothing, sure. probably. Sure. Um, but because um, you're still using a muscle. But um, um, but yeah, it's not. It's not. We we would say it's not functional strength to do very limited exercises like that. Um, and it's not necessarily going to give benefits overall to your health and your your body, your form. Um, it might increase the size of the muscle slightly, but um, in terms of your overall health uh and health and holistic you know etymologically they're the same word so you have to think holistically so you, and the only you know you're designed not to do things in um isolation mm-hmm. every movement that the human body is designed we're designed to move in you know if you want to put it technically we're designed to move in multi-plane and multi-directional fashion the entire time not linear not doing this um not lying on the ground and doing crunches you're designed to run, jump, spin, you know, at the same time. Yeah. That's what he's meant to do. That's what kids do if you watch them. Sure. So um, you sh- therefore, that should be your basic training, should be natural movement. Often, it has to be, first, often you have problems that have to be corrected because of people's lifestyles. Obviously, have led them to sometimes not, uh, you know, they'll have um uh, valgus fault in their knees for example they, they won't be able to squat down without the knees going in just because mm-hmm. their muscles have become so weak and, and all that they, they they no longer have the ability to squat properly or whatever so right. sometimes you have to go back to functional movement screening type things and get those corrected at the beginning but right from the start right from day one class one they will be moving over obstacles clambering around climbing swinging jumping vaulting because guess what that's what they're designed to do and that's what they can do they can do that from as soon as they can walk. So um, they they should be doing that right from the start um, with enough, but but just with uh, with enough intensity so that it's not going to do them any damage right. until they're strong enough to do those movements on a larger scale. Um, so there needs to be you know a lot of thought about that. But the aim, our aim is always to get them doing functional exercises, functional movement. And by when we say functional, we mean really functional. There's a lot of in the fitness industry. There's a lot of people that say functional training. And you look at it and it's just like, you know, um, all what they mean by that is uh, body weight squats or something like that, you know, uh, or pull ups or whatever. Great. Those drills are great, but they're not, that's not for us. That's not functional. Fun- functional means in terms of the human body means being able to carry out the functions of the human body. Hmm. And the functions of the human body are 
running, jumping, climbing, fighting, you know, um, all the kind of crazy multi-directional movements that we do. That's what your body's designed to do. So unless yeah. your training yeah. is is doing that, then it's not functional. It's restricted. So it doesn't matter how many, you know, pull-ups you can do or push-ups. They're very useful tools and we train them too. But the functional training is can you climb up onto this wall and get up onto it and stand on it from the ground? That, yeah. that whole exercise what we would call a wall run or a climb up maybe or whatever that whole exercise is the basic functional drill sort of thing yeah um not the pull up bit but actually stand on the ground end up uh, seven feet up on that wall yeah so, and if right. you can do that whole exercise that's the functional drill i yeah. love that that's cool you know it's it's so funny i was uh in thailand a few weeks ago and there were a group of us and we're all americans and cream puffs and not nearly as functional as, as what you're talking about. And there was this, <laughs> this group of um, Thai guys behind us. And one of them just out of nowhere, most of our backs were turned, but like I turned my head and just saw him scramble up this enormous, probably 50, 60 feet up mm -hmm. this, uh, this coconut palm. And just, you know, without any tools or anything, he just like scrambles up the whole thing and uh, starts like throwing down coconuts and then scrambles back down. And we're all just like in shock because that's so absurd and then like one of my one of my buddies <laughs> goes up and he's like oh i can do that and he gets like like a foot blank <laughs> up and then drops back down he's like oh that's really hard i can't do that yeah. at all how do you get from where he is and where i am oh, quite honestly to being able to scramble up and down trees and that sort of thing especially with no branches well i mean the the the, the, the there's one obvious answer um which is kind of uh Funakoshi, uh, one of the, the founders of um, Japanese karate, he, uh, Gichin Funakoshi, he said, if you want to be good at karate, train karate. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right? So if you want to be good at that type of movement, drum roll, <laughs> yeah. go do that type of movement. Um, so the reason that guy is good at it, that the, the Thai guy that did that, is not because he does some special conditioning drill with wires and ropes in a gym and then goes out and applies it on a tree. Mm -hmm. It's because... He just climbs the tree every day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so his body gets really good at doing it. So um, therefore, uh, again, it comes back to this idea of functionality. If you want to be good at that stuff, you want to be good at um, running, jumping, climbing, overcoming challenges, overcoming these feats, getting from one place to another, you know, jumping gaps. Uh, you have to go and do it. Mm -hmm. You must go and do it. So you must move your training to an environment like that, which wasn't designed for training on. That's another very important part of it um uh is adapting your movement and yourself to a space and to a, an environment and a terrain that wasn't designed um for training um and that's a really important point and and it's kind of a, especially in the states is a difficult point because you know so much training is kept into the gyms yeah. kept aside for liability issues a lot of the time and and, and you know uh, private land issues and all that stuff um but it's a little bit easier over here in Europe, but um, you know, I think you have to go and train in places that weren't designed for it because then, then you really understand overcoming a task. You can't move the boxes, you know, closer together outdoors. The walls are just that far apart. That's the way it is. And yes, there is a branch there sticking in your face. And yes, there is a, a pole there. And yes, that bit of wall's got a bit of moss on it, so I have to look out because it's slippery. Um, those, all those elements which are unplanned and unprepared mean I have to adapt. And that adaptation is what makes that guy able to climb the tree because he's able to, the next tree won't be exactly the same. It'll be leaning in a different direction. It'll have different branches, different surface. He'll still climb it though because he's used to adapting to, you know. So you couldn't just take that tree, put it in a gym, train all day on that tree either. By limiting it to just that tree, it would no longer be a functional movement. It would be limited in its, in its paradigm and you would get good at climbing that tree. But then when, it, when the tree was slightly different, you'd be like, oh, I can't climb it. Yeah. So... The, it's very important to get outside and actually face the real world challenges, the sort of functional, you know, that's, that's functionality is actually going out and doing it. And that's why, you know, for, for me, that first arm jump was so, uh, thrilling and, and enlivening because I was like, this is, I'm actually being asked to do this here. There's no, you know, it's not, can, it's not sort of, that's one of the problems with, um, with one of the problems that you have with a lot of martial arts is that in martial arts, actually many disciplines, you can pretend to be good, right? Because yeah. you wear a nice colored belt uh, and you've done all these Catherine forms and you've trained in it for years and you've got all the badges. Um, and so you can pretend 
that you're a deadly fighting machine, right? But and because no one ever tests you unless you're actually put in a real fight. How do you know? You don't yeah. know. So you, you can pretend to yourself and to others. In parkour, you cannot pretend. There's no way of faking it. Either you can do the jump or you can't. That's yeah. it. End yeah. of story. Um, and, and, I, and I really like that. I really like the fact that it was, I often think of it like a, it's like a big mirror. Every time you go to train, um, it's like someone holds a, a big full length mirror up to you. Uh, and straight away, you see every strength and weakness you have that at that given moment, physically, mentally, everything is reflected to you um, without any judgment. It just tells you this is where you are yeah. physically. And, and the answers are pretty ruthless. The answers are, yes, you can do this jump or no, you can't do it. And the reason you can't do it today is because you, know, you don't have the, the precision or you don't have the strength or, you, or co- you're not confident enough yet or whatever. And it gives you immediate, real feedback. Um, and you can work on that. The next day, come back and the mirror will still be there, but it will reflect what you are now. Um, and the next day or a week later, you may have not been training for the, for the whole week. You come back and you're feeling a bit you know, rusty and the mirror just says, well, guess what? You're crap now because you haven't done your training. So, um, it's, uh, and that kind of, um, that, that, uh, feedback that you get from parkour and that the inability to cheat yourself, uh, is really important because it's honest training. Yeah. So what if you're an elite though? What if, what if you've been doing it for years? You're very accomplished. You've done ridiculous things. Is it kind of like this evil Knievel type thing where at first you ride a dirt bike over two school buses and then it's like 50 school buses and then it's like through fire over 400? Or is there like this, this point where you're like, okay, that's enough. Now I'm just going to change things up a little bit and see what else I can do. Like, how does that, that work for you guys? Well, it's, I mean, it's kind of the same as any real, you know, um, lifetime discipline in that, yeah, as you get better, you get more capable and your your fear gets pushed back and your limits get pushed back. And so you become more and more capable of doing, you know, stuff that people would look at and go, wow, that's superhuman. It's not superhuman. It's just that you trained a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, for example, you know, we may uh, we, we may look at someone on a on a BMX doing some amazing stunts and, you know, big spins and landing on railings on his BMX and whatever. And we would look at that and go, how the hell do you do that? Yeah. Because right? we uh, we find that hard enough just doing it on our feet. This guy's doing it on a bike. Um, so, um, but again, he, and he would look at us and say, well, how do you guys do the jumps you do? Um, it's just training, right? So, so yes, you, you do improve the size of your movements and you do improve the, you, you increase the complexity of them. And, um, you may therefore become confident enough to deal with jumps that have maybe, um, or look at, look as if they have a higher risk from the outside. You know, someone may look at that jump and go, wow, that's so risky. But from your perspective, it is not really because you're so capable of doing the jump, you know, know, 99.9% you're going to make it fine. So, um, so same as any discipline. Um, you do, you just push everything back. Um, you do reach a level where when you begin, you're kind of just in love with the, you know, with, um, with overcoming those fear challenges and you're in love with, um, the novelty of the movement and the novelty of exploring your terrain in that way. After a while, years of training, that becomes kind of, um, you know, still good, but it's just part of the process. Mm. You're not, it's not so, not so important now. Then you, then yes, you find that people will start to, experiment and develop more their own path and focus on bits that they that for them really suit their movement their body their mind um some very experienced guys i know you know they or some of the founders for example they've been training like 25 years now um so they've kind of proven in a way they've proven to themselves everything they need to prove in mm-hmm. terms of fear physical challenges mental challenges they've kind of done that to the nth degree they know what their limits are now in that area and they know what their strengths are so now a lot of those guys will uh the majority of their training will be uh kind of internal training through the movement you know mm-hmm. will be about looking for real quality in tiny movements and real absolute perfection in uh in maybe one particular jump or something like that um or you know just being being as fluid as you can be or as quiet as you can be or something like that but They'll look for very, very, very precise, small, tiny details. So some of the more experienced guys you'll see doing very weird training. <laughs> that if you're a beginner, you look at it and go, why the hell is he doing that? Yeah. You know, I, I want to do the backflip. Um, but when you train a lot more, you realize actually what he's doing is really, really, really hard hmm. um, and takes years to be, you know, and the backflip you can learn in a day, which to be honest, you can. Yeah. So um, so I think um, it comes to that, yeah, you just, you begin to, 
you begin to personalize it more, I suppose. Yeah. You begin to, you know, what do I really want to get out of this? Um, why do I train? I guess your motivation comes into it. Why am I doing this? Because now, I, yeah, I can jump, I can climb, I can get up buildings, I can do this drop, I can do the acrobatics. So why? Why? You know, initially that's your reason to train, though, is to be able to do that stuff, and yeah. then you can do that stuff. So then it becomes a why do I train, and then that that comes down to your inner motivation um, as to what you're looking for, um, and that's a really important question to you know to ask all the time. Sure, because sure. your answer your answer changes all the time as well. Right, right. So, so um, we're actually we're coming up on time, but I had a question that I would love to ask from from uh, one of my listeners actually, uh, who knew that I was interviewing you about okay. parkour, and they asked. Uh, she's a woman, and she's she's just like, well, does this work for women? Do women do this? Because I think there's this this conception, probably misconception, that it's just a bunch of crazy young adrenaline junkie chain smoking <laughs> guys who you know have nothing better to do with their time than to jump yeah. from building to building but there's actually real art and grace in this as well can, oh, can yeah, you yeah. uh talk about that a bit yeah i mean it's understandable that it's seen as male dominated it, it still probably is male dominated when it was you know until about six seven years ago there were like 10 women in the world that did it wow. and that's because it came from a group of guys i suppose um although they were surrounded by some female presences as well who were also training but it was mainly guys um and the guys were doing the big stuff and that got the attention mm. um but you know we spent a lot of time building the female community in the uk and that became the, the a, a very strong community of female practitioners and then the rest of the world then kind of imitated that and were inspired by that and so now there are female communities all around the world yeah absolutely the answer is absolutely yes women can do it we have you know uh on our professional team there are female coaches and female performers who are incredible, fantastic, and they don't only coach women. We will regularly, you know, they will just train with, they will coach with the other guys. So they will regularly run sessions for big groups of guys and beast those guys. <laughs> they will destroy them. Um, there's, there's, no, there's, no, uh, there's no way that, there's no reason that women uh, need to train, you know, do a, a dumbed down version of parkour. No, no, no. The, the girls that I know would, um, would laugh at that. I mean, they're incredibly yeah. strong, incredibly fit, incredibly capable Yes, they move in a way that fits their body, but everyone should do that. So even the way, you know, you we're both guys, the way you would move is going to be different from the way I would move because mm -hmm. our physiology, our anatomy is different. Uh, and therefore, a woman needs to listen to her anatomy and how that wants her to move. So, you know, for example, women typically will start off with better balance than guys because their central gravity is lower. So they're more capable of balancing on things than, than men are when they begin. But the men have got more bone density and more muscular power. So they will be able to do bigger jumps. But, you know, we don't say this is better than that. It's right. just they're, they're just different attributes because of their anatomy, their physiology and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, women can do it. Uh, we run uh, loads of events that have hundreds of women at them. Uh, we have female coaches, female performers. Um, they're all amazing. So yeah, no excuses. That's so cool. I love it. So we're just about out of, out of time, like I said, but before we go, can you tell folks uh, where they can find you, what you guys are working on and, and how people can get started? Yeah, sure. Um, well, you can find us on uh, parkourgenerations.com, I guess is the central website. We've got a few sites um, and we've got, a, we've got a, a site now for our operations in the States, which is um, uh, pkgamericas.com. But you can find it via the main site. Um, we, you can, you know, if you, if you want to come and train, then you can find classes there. Um, we've got lists of coaches as well. If, you, if, you're, if you're a practitioner you're involved in, and, you, and you're interested in getting involved in coaching, then there's the ADAPT certifications, which are now kind of um, the uh, international coaching certifications that run around the world for parkour. Uh, and we've also just launched uh, the Parkour Fitness Specialist, which is a certification for fitness professionals and personal trainers to understand the sort of principles of, of functional training in this way and, and movement training and introduce them into their paradigm. So there's lots of ways you can get involved. Um, you can also just begin training, you know, just get out and move. You don't necessarily need to go to a class. You may not have a teacher or a class near you. Uh, it was started without classes. When I started, there were no classes. You know, we were the first ones teaching in the world. So um, you can just go out and train. Just go and move. Just explore your environment. Um, find out what your body can do, you know, incrementally and gradually progress. Um, but, yeah, there's no reason why you can't just get out and be more active and, uh, and go from there. You know, there's plenty of inspiration you can find online now as well. So, uh, but, yeah, use the community, online community. There's There's – big communities in every country in the world now and they're, they're most of them are awesome really really cool communities but very open they'll be very willing to show people um how to get involved yeah go outside and climb a coconut palm 
Exactly. <laughs> Go outside and move. That's that's the key. Get out there, move, test yourself, <laughs> take some risks. You know, take some risks, and uh, that will remind you why you're alive. Um, yeah. So I think it's that's that's the key. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for coming on. This was an absolute pleasure. I would love to do it again soon. And um, I'll, I'll definitely be looking up some videos after that. I'm, I'm getting inspired. I, I think I might have to do this. <laughs> yeah, you should, man. You should, absolutely. We'll get you involved. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. Thanks, I hope.